We're beginning in the book of Thessalonians, chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2. I'm going to ask you to stand out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's word. The letter was written to the Thessalonians to encourage them to remain uh, thankful to the Lord for what he's done and to remain watchful. Those are the two themes. Uh, faithfulness. Be faithful to God and be watchful because he will come again. Amen? Amen. He's coming. Chapter 2, verse 1 reads, You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi. As you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. Let's pray. Father, Father, I pray that you'd bless the reading of your word this morning, Lord. I pray that you would anoint me, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit to proclaim your very words this morning. That your message will go out to your people, Lord. That we would be encouraged by what we hear and inspired, Lord, to go out and to serve you with a fresh, new wind and fire in our hearts, Lord, for your kingdom's sake. For we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, there's good news and bad news, like I said. The good news is there's only like, what, 20 verses in this chapter. And the bad news is that doesn't mean we'll finish on time. Amen. Let's, I want to draw your attention back. Remember in chapter 1, he gave the thanksgiving uh, to the brothers, and he talked about, I said that they had convictions, deep convictions. I told you that I would call that passage, uh, the, the sermon that I preached, Convictions of Steel. And he's talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we go into chapter 2. We said in chapter 1, we've seen uh, Gentiles actually turn from idols to serve the living God. We see impact. In chapter 2, this is how it starts. The Apostle Paul writes, he says, You know, brothers, that our visit to you in Thessalonica was not a failure. We had previously suffered and had been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. This is amazing to me. The Apostle Paul's humility, as he describes his time in Philippi, as being insulted. Somebody have a different translation? Chapter, chapter 2, read verses, uh, verse 2. Anybody, any translation. Go ahead, Frank. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamely entreated. Shamely entreated. Is that, that's NLT? That's NLT. Anybody else? Treated outrageously. That's much better. Anybody else? Different translation? Spitefully treated. Hmm. Mistreated and insulted. These are understatements, folks. Huh? Anybody else? Abominably. What'd you say? How badly we've been treated. Let me sneak a peek here into Acts chapter 16 to just show you how bad they were treated. In Acts chapter 16, if you want to turn and it's up to you, but in chapter 16, verse 11, he says, From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samorothras, and next day on to Neapolis. There, from there, we traveled to Philippi. Okay? So in chapter 16 in the book of Acts, he says, We've traveled to Philippi. In chapter 16, verse 12. You scoot on down just four mere verses in chapter 12. I'm sorry, chapter 16, verse 16. So 16, 16. He says, once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. For those of you who dabble in fortune telling and, and Dion Warwick psychic hotline and crystal balls and all that other garbage, pay attention. He says, once we were going to a place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of her money from her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days, and finally, Paul became so troubled, trans Lake County translation says irritated, so annoyed by her, that he turned around and said to the spirit in her, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that her hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them. This is how they were treated. What was the word? Abominably insulted in Philippi. This is Philippi. Okay, so they cast out a demon, 
the slave owners lose their ability to make some money. So they dragged Paul and Silas to the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are, are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans, us Romans, <laughs> to practice. They joined the attack against Paul and Silas. Attack. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. They were just insulted. They were just treated badly, Paul said. He left out the details, folks. He got the tar beat out of them. And after they had been severely flogged, my translation says, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in an inner cell and fastened their feet to the stocks. The beat now wasn't enough. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, not crying and weeping, saying, God, why me? Like we like to do. And the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake and the foundation of the prison was shaken and at once the prison doors flew open. Everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, sleeping on the job, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he knew he was a dead duck because he let the prisoners get away because he was sleeping on the job. Because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul, verse 28, shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What a testimony. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke these words to the, of the Lord to him and all the others. And at that very hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Look at the response. First of all, the testimony of Paul and Silas that they were, they were faithful to the end, even after getting beaten and flogged and chained to a jail cell. They're being watched. They're being guarded. The foundation of the, of the jail is shaken. The, the chains come off. They could have left. They didn't. They stand there, and they continue to share the word of the Lord with prisoners and even the prison guard, and then they, save, they, they lead him and his entire household to the Lord. Then they get baptized. And look at the, the response from the jailer, but look at the response of Paul and Silas. As they served this man, they were ministers of God's grace. Verse 34, the jailer brought them to the house and set a meal before them. Look at that hospitality. Filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. Not because he didn't get his head chopped off by the Roman authorities, but because he'd come to faith in Christ. When it was daylight, the magistrate sent the officer to the jailer to order the release of those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrate said, the ordered that you and Silas be released and now you can leave, go in peace. But... This was the, severely, uh, the severe treatment that they received in Philippi. This was the insults. We get mad when we walk into a church, and I'm guilty of this, folks. We get mad when we walk into a church and somebody doesn't greet you. <clears throat> not a very friendly church. So you get mad at God, you give up on God. Well, maybe it's not the church for you. Find another one. We get mad because the ball doesn't bounce our way, and we cry and we complain and we give up and we quit on God. And I go back to the illustration of these girls, 80-something losses. He says, some of those girls quit. Oh, their character was revealed. You know, what kind of Christian are you? Do you have the endurance to persevere? The Christian walk is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And if you're sprinting 26 miles, you will be done soon, folks. Okay? It is not a sprint. And so we see this. We see what's going on here. The character of these men. The character of those girls on that TV, the, the, the news clip that I showed you, this is what I want you to see. And Paul shows up and he says, now you know, brothers. This is how he starts his letter in chapter 2. He says, now you know, brothers. He's sending this letter to the church in Thessalonica. See, I said it right. He says, our visit to you was not a failure. Even though I only stayed a whopping two weeks and I had to leave. Four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. People argue over how long it was. doesn't even matter. Well, let's give them two months. We're going to call it eight weeks for the sake of discussion. Give them the most time. What did you learn in eight weeks, Christian? How much could you share? How effective can you be in eight weeks? Some of us have been Christians significantly longer than that, and we're not nearly as fruitful. We've previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you about his gospel in spite of the strong opposition. Verse 3, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. For the appeal we make does not spring from error 
or impure motive, nor are we trying to trick you. Somebody read verse 3 in a different translation. Nice. Anybody else? Anybody else? Somebody's back there reading. Was that you, Bernadette? Somebody else? Very good. Verse 3 in the NIV. For our appeal that we make does not spring forth from error, or impure motives. Let me ask you something, folks. What are my motives? You have no idea. I could be up here preaching and teaching the gospel for whatever. You don't know. You may think you know, but you don't. Maybe it's power. Maybe I want to build a mega church or a kingdom unto myself. Maybe it's I like listening to myself talk. Why do I do what I do? I'll tell you why, because I've been called by God to do it. And that's the only reason why I continue to do it, because trust me, it's not easy. The headaches that come with ministry, the heartache that comes with ministry, you better be called by God or you won't last. That's just the truth. Amen. Now, the reality is people who get involved in ministry, whether they're the pastor or the music team or they're the sound techs or they're ushers or they're greeters or they're Sunday school teachers, all their motives aren't always pure. They're not. And you'll never know what their true motives are. They'll reveal them in time, I presume, if, if you're able to pay attention. But see, everybody who does it, I think of, I try to stay away from bashing other religions or any like people on TV, but some of these televangelists, you know, look, at their, look at their ministries. They're humongous. I'm going to use them as an example anyway. I don't care. He could sue me if he wants, I guess. But Joe Osteen, you see his church? My gosh. It is. It's, a, it's an ex-football stadium. There's tens of thousands of people in there. You know, what would motivate a man like that? Clover's giving me an amen. <laughs> what would motivate, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I could say, but I'm not saying that his motives are impure, but when you get to that and things are not going right or whatever, I mean, how difficult would it be for a person in that position to just bow out and say, you know what, I'm done? You know, there, now money's rolling and there's a lot of things going on. There's other things that may motivate him to do what he does. And I don't know that, but I do know this. You listen to his messages and you're very, if ever, and I think by his own admission, he doesn't preach on sin. He won't talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. He won't. The Bible says that in the latter days that people will gather and they will settle for the tickling of their ears instead of sound doctrine. They will not put up with sound doctrine in the end days, the latter days. Okay, so what could motivate Jose Burgos to build a big church is to start preaching some feel-good messages, make people laugh, and have everybody leave feeling good about themselves. But if I'm not preaching the full counsel of God, then Lord have mercy on me. So what motivates people to do what they do? The Apostle Paul says in verse 3, he says, listen, he says, our appeal, he says, did not come. He says, for our appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. No, we are trying, nor are we trying to trick you. It is what it is. You know, I'll preach God's word, and when I throw it out there, I say, hey, look, if you can't say amen, at least say ouch. If you don't like it, go to another church. I say that all the time. You can't follow my leadership, because I'm telling you, I will submit myself to the Lord to the best of my ability, and I will preach the message that God has laid on my heart. In fact, I stand in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday without any notes, completely relying on the Holy Spirit to give me the words that he wants me to speak. And so if you can't, if, if you can't accept what, what you don't, if you don't believe my motives are pure, you're in the wrong church. You need to go somewhere else and worship God someplace else. Don't give up on God. But find a pastor, find a church where you can. Trust your pastor. Trust your leaders. For the appeal we make, he says, does not spring from impure motives. No, it does not. Nor are we trying to trick you. I'm not trying to trick you. It is what it is. God's word is God's word. I preach from his word, and I don't bring in all this extra fluff. You either like it or you don't. And if you don't, that's your price between you and God. I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to water it down. And if you don't like it, I really don't care. Because thus saith the Lord. Verse 4, on the contrary, he says, we speak as men approved by God. 
to be entrusted with the gospel. God has called me to preach his word. I do the best I can to pre prepare myself to stand in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday and give you the message that God has laid on my heart. He says, we speak as men approved by God. He says, to, entrust, to be entrusted with the gospel. I have no idea why God has called me to be his servant. No idea. Because I certainly don't deserve his glory. Isn't that the song we sang? Our hearts don't deserve his glory. I do not deserve God's favor in my life, but God pours it out anyway. God has given me a tremendous responsibility in preaching his word, and I take it serious, and I am grateful for it. Why? Because I've earned it? I'm telling you, I have not. There's no way that I should be standing before you, but by God's grace and God's mercy, I am what I am, as the scripture teaches. But he says, we are men approved by God. God has called me. God has ordained me. The church has, yeah. But God has called me to it. It doesn't matter what people think. We're not trying to be approved by men, the scripture says. He says, we're not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. He's calling God Almighty to... Amen, basically what he's saying. I say it time and again. When I stand in the pulpit, if I am preaching with impure motives, I pray God would kill me. Would you say that? I will. If I stand in the pulpit ever proclaiming something for my benefit instead of yours, I pray God would just smoke me right on the spot. I drop dead and die. If that ever happens, you can assume that God judged me instantly. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect because I'm not. Trust me, you don't have to look very far to see my imperfections and my flaws. What I'm saying is when I'm proclaiming God's word, I do so with pure motives. The full counsel of God to the best of my ability. If I'm in error, it's because I'm imperfect, not because my motives. We didn't put on a mask. Oh, everything is beautiful. God loves you. I'm not going to tell you all this. Full. I mean, you got all these... This health, wealth, and prosperity gospel preachers, they say, blab it and grab it. I'm a son of the king. God wants me to have money, and I'm on it now. So you're praying for millions because you think God's going to give it to you. But it don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. They teach, they, they use, I've used this example before. The, the scripture speaks of favoritism. Guy walks through the door, he looks like a hobo. Smells like one, too. Another guy walks through the other door, and he's wearing a nice Armani, Armani suit. We give the hobo the seat in the back, right next to poor Brother George. Hopefully, Brother George has got some air freshener. And we bring the, the other guy up front, we bring him a lazy boy. There you go, sit down and recline it. You want something to drink? And we take care of him. That's favoritism. And we're flattering this guy, and we're trying to, because, he, because of what he brings to the table. That's not biblical. So we never use flattery. No, we didn't try to cover up or put on a mask or greet. God is our witness. This is not our motives. Our motives is the pure, unadulterated word of God. That's it. And that's what the Apostle Paul appeals to the, to the Thessalonians. He says, listen, when we came and we, we planted this church, this is what he says. I'm going to back up again. I'll give it all to you in context. He says, you know, brothers, our visit to you was not a failure. Previously, we had suffered insults in Philippi. He's referring to the jailing and the beating. But you know that with the help of our God, we dared to share his gospel in spite of the strong opposition. He shared it with the jailer. He shared it with the prisoners. He did all of that. And he goes, so now... Our appeal doesn't come forth from, uh, spring forth from error or impure motives, no. What did we have to gain? What did we have to gain? You know, there's, there's coming a time for me as a pastor where I'll be able to retire from the police department and everybody thinks, oh, great, you retire. You don't understand. When I retire, I'm not getting paid. I've got to go 10 years before I can collect a pension. Okay, so there's a time real close for me where I could actually go into full-time ministry. Okay, and then the church would be responsible for paying me a salary so that I could sustain my life and my family. Okay, but are those my motives? When I first started in the ministry, I didn't get a dime. So it's not about the money. And trust me, it's not about the money. The budget here is not huge. It's not a very large budget. It's not about the money. It is about the kingdom of God. So my motives, what's pastor's motives, what's pastor's motives, strip it all away. We can meet in your basement. Because all this doesn't mean anything to me. It really doesn't. Don't get me wrong. It is, a, it is a building that God has given us. It is an opportunity that God has provided. And we should be grateful for the resources in which he's provided us. 
But strip it all away, and the mission doesn't change. We still have a responsibility to proclaim God's message to the world that's out there, building or not, money or not. Amen? If you don't have a penny to give to the ministry, we couldn't, we couldn't pay for the lights here or the heat. $1,100 NIPSCO bill. Couldn't pay for that. Couldn't pay for the plows to come in and plow the parking lot if we didn't have money. But strip it all away. We can meet in the park. Better dress warm. The mission doesn't change, folks. It's still the same. He says, we did not come with impure motives. No, we come as men approved by God and trusted with the gospel. We're trying to please, if we are trying to please men, we're, uh, but we're trying to please God. He says, who tests our hearts? Verse 5, you know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We're not looking for praise from men. I'm not looking for the pat on the back. I'm not looking for the pastor, you so cool. Not from you or anyone else, he says. He desires to please God. This is a great template. This is a great model for the Christian. Whether you're a deacon, whether you're just a regular old Christian with no title, whether you're a pastor, it doesn't matter. This is a great model for a church, folks. A church that's just weeks old. As apostle of Christ, he says, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle. Somebody, translation, verse 7, read a, a synonym for gentle. Like children? You know, gentleness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? But what is gentleness? Gentleness is love in action. Um, in our world in which we live in, I was, Tina and I was watching the Titanic yesterday, and the guy, he's a jerk, man. The guy who's Kate Winslet, he's courting her. His name's Cal. Cal is a real jerk to, to Jack. Jack gets all cleaned up, and man, if you see, if you haven't seen this movie, this is your fault. <laughs> Here's a new newsflash, the ship sinks. Okay. But yeah, yeah. It sinks. It does. The unthinkable ship sinks. It does. It really does. Seriously, honestly. I know you believe me. But anyway, he comes and, and Jack is in a tuxedo and he's going to dinner with all these big muckety mucks and he's and he's and he's imitating. He's imitating people. He's looking at the because he don't know, he's he's standing like this. And he looks around, and he sees the men walking. Actually it's like this. They go to the young ladies, they're like, <laughs> and so he's watching this. Sorry about that, John. He gave me the stink eye. Sorry. But anyway, I should have used your hand, Tina. But anyway, he goes. <laughs> Over the top, right? Over the top. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, that's not what Jack Dawson did. No, he's walking around. He's being a gentleman. He's walking, hands are swinging. And he's watching these guys, and he's imitating them. And then the, the jerk, Cal, comes up to him and she goes, hey, you remember Jack? And he turns around and he looks at him and he goes, oh, man, I hardly recognize you. You can almost pass for a gentleman, he says. And then, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio, is, you know, he's real cool and calm. He says, almost, you know, and then he plays off. You know, he doesn't feed into it. Gentleman. What is a gentleman? It's a good question. Someone who makes them those around him feel comfortable. Is he a wimp? No, gentlemen, if you go, we, we, are, we don't have any idea what a gentleman is these days, folks. Our society has watered that down, tore it up bad. We, we, we think a gentleman is a, is a floor mat. He lays down and lets people walk on him because he's a nice guy. No, that's not a gentleman. A gentleman is a man who stands up for his family and watches out for, his, for his, those people he loves, loves, those people he cares about. He is a man, but he's a gentle Man, gentle, gentle, being conscious of other people's needs, being conscious of their feelings, being conscious of their perception. Tender, great uh, synonym, tender. Doesn't mean you're soft. <laughs> soft doesn't mean you're soft, but a gentle man. So what does the word say? It says, the word of God says, but we were gentle among you. We were gentle among you. Uh, Brother Hank was in the hospital, and I went to go see him, and uh, we were talking about numerous topics. And one of the things he said was, you know, he says, even when the truth is communicated, and if it's not done in love, he says, it's brutal. <laughs> Remember that? He said, he said, when the truth is communicated, 
if it's not done in love, he said, it's brutal. And I thought about that. I said, yeah, gentle. Hey, I got to tell you, hey, I don't like that sweater vest. I just don't. You don't like it. You know, and I tell him like that. You know, hey, it is what it is. Well, that's pretty messed up for me to come and tell him, even if that's not the truth. But if it was the truth, for me to tell him that. Being gentle, if he asks me, what do you think of my sweater? I will tell him, it looks good on you. You know, if he says, well, what do you think of it? I say, I think it looks good on you. You know, I myself wouldn't wear that. I don't think I look right in it, but it looks great on you. That's being gentle. Folks, it's a lost art. We feel entitled. We feel empowered to tell people what we want. And you know what? If we're not careful, Christians do the same thing. We beat people over the head with our Bibles all day long. Well, God says, God says, he smokes, he drinks, he's this, he's that. I'm so sick of that. The, what does the scripture say? I'm so sick of it. Yes, we have a responsibility to be holy, as the scripture says. But you are not the judge. Okay, now, I always have Christians who are sinning deliberately and openly, and then they tell you, oh, yeah, got to judge. Well, you know what? That's not the right attitude either. But the scripture says you walking around judging your brother with the little bitty speck he's got in his eye when you got a big old beam sticking out of yours. Take the beam out your eyeball, and you'll be able to see clearer. Square yourself away first, and then you can square away your brother. The old adage is you live in a glass house, you shouldn't. Jesus said he is without sin can cast a. Okay, so what we're talking about is being gentle. You have a, is that me again? Because I'm going to have to go like this. I'm going old school if it is. But uh, anyway. He says, as an apostle, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. You know, there's a, a I don't know, say he's not here, but Brother Ron uh, Ackerman. Uh, the, the fact that this man is even in church today blows me away. He's been beaten, metaphorically, by pastors and leaders in churches for, for years. And Ron said, no, I'll never set foot in a church again. Never gave up on God, folks. Never gave up on God. His love for God is one thing. His desire to be in church was another. And the fact that he came here, you know, he said he was invited, first of all. And when he got here, he felt welcomed. That's, an, that's a testimony to you, church. We've made him feel welcome. Nobody judged him. We were gentle. He says, I could have, as an apostle, verse 6, he says, of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. And that's what some of these preachers are. They're just, they're a burden. He says, but no, we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. This is cool. I always use Christy as my example because she's my first kid and I knew nothing. I could barely find my behind in the dark with both hands, let alone t tend to a child. And I didn't know nothing about being a dad. So my kid's laying on the ground or on the floor. We have a pallet we made up with blankets. <laughs> you remember this? And I go over and I go, oh, look, she's got a strong grip. And Christy grabs my fingers. And I, you remember it? <laughs> and I pick Christy up off the ground. Christy's head goes. She can't hold it up. Her head's back like this. I go, look, and her head goes. And I'm holding on her hands, and Tina goes, hey, you're going to break her neck. You know, I'm like, she's fine. And I think I'm being gentle. Man, guys don't know nothing about being gentle. We think we, we're gorillas. We're apes. You know, we had, yeah, <laughs> we had a computer, and Tina goes, hey, turn the computer on. I go over there, and I push the button, and, and she goes, dang, because they go, bah! The thumb, the, my thumb breaks the button off. They pushed it in. It wouldn't come back out. She goes, dang, Jose, you and your bionic thumb, you know. I started laughing. And, I, and I'm like, I, and then there was another thing I broke. I just, I'm, a, I'm an ape. I'm a gorilla. And I think I'm gentle, but I'm not. Dudes don't know nothing about There's no finesse. You know what my model is? If it don't fit, you force it. That's the truth. Now, picture this Christie's head going, <laughs> picked her up, her head going back like this and then going forward. By the time Natalie came around, I had a little under my belt. Some, I had some, you know, she said, thank God. I had some experience. <laughs> thank God is right. Poor Christy. Lord have mercy. But anyway, he says, verse 7, he says, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. 
a mother caring for her children is something different. Totally different than a dude. In fact, you think you meet the sweetest women. You think, oh, she's so sweet. She's so nice. Fool one of her kids. You watch. Mother Hen becomes Mother Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. But anyway, he says, we could have been bold. We could have been a burden to you as an apostle. We have that right. We have that authority. Thus saith the Lord. He said, but that's not the approach we took. We took a gentle approach like a mother who's caring for her children. We love you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. You catch that? So he says, hey, you know, and this is, this is what we, this, church, this, we stink at this. And it's the truth. We'll share the word. When it comes to sharing our lives, we want in our circle who we want in our circle and nobody else. We don't want to share our lives. You'll pass somebody on the road and say, hey, is that brother so-and-so? Ah, it didn't look like him. You just keep on trucking because you don't want to give it a second look because he might need a ride. We don't want to share our lives. We'll sit next to people. We won't even talk to them. We don't want to look at them. Sit on an airplane. You don't look at the person next to you like, you know, we don't want to share our lives with nobody except who we want to share it with. And he says, we love you so much that we were delighted. Somebody's translation read different synonym for delighted. Verse 8. I believe in keeping it real. Who uses the word delighted on a daily basis here? Anybody? <laughs> Not usually. Well, you probably doing that. What was it? Verse 8, it says, we love you so much that we were well pleased. Well pleased to share with you not only the gospel of our God, but also our lives as well. Anybody else besides well pleased? That we shared with you? Delighted. Well pleased. Some of us will share our lives, but I can assure you we're not well pleased or delighted. <sighs> What's the matter? Oh, he got home group tonight, and I got to clean up this house. <sighs> Why do we ever agree to do that? Thank God it's only three months. We short, you know. Everybody comes over, and they pile up. <sighs> I got a sweep and mop now. Pile of dishes. We're not delighted to share our lives. We're pathetic, church. We are. Where's the love? Where's the joy? This church is a great example, and it's a whopping two months old at the most. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters. Look what he says. Surely you remember, verse 9, brothers and sisters, our turmoil or our, our toil and hardship, we work night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You know what that is? That is a man, Paul, who was an apostle who preached the word, and as a, a responsibility or a sense of, of uh, ownership in the gospel of the church, those people should have been providing for him. They should have been taking care of his needs. But the Apostle Paul was a tent maker by trade. The Apostle Paul worked with his hands too, so he would not be a burden to the church. Folks, this is why I have a job. This is why I work. Financially, if I retire, there's going to be a financial strain on the church. And not that it's a strain, but there's a financial responsibility. It's the same concept. In, in context, it applies. The apostle Paul says, you know what, I will work so I don't be a burden. I, I'm an apostle and I have these rights, but you know what, he says, I didn't, I didn't uh, claim those rights. He says, I put you before myself. I come in here, many of you know I worked midnights for many years. I'd come in here with little or no sleep. And it's been a burden. It has not been a burden for me. It's been a joy. But how long can you keep that up, do you think? <clears throat> He says, in order to not burden any of you while we preach the gospel to you, verse 10, he says, you are witnesses and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Can you say that, church? I know that I cannot. You are witnesses, he tells the church. This is Paul writing to the Thessalonians. You, Thessalonian church, our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, holy, we know the translation, what the word means to be set apart, to be used by God. Righteous. We are righteous in the sight of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ and blameless we were among you in who believed. But that's not what he's talking about. 
We are righteous because of Jesus Christ's righteousness. We are blameless because we've been forgiven. And we are holy because we're called to be holy because we have been separated from the world to serve God. So that verse and at surface is true. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about emotives, service. He's talking about how he lived his life. Does your walk match your talk? We can sit here on Sunday morning and on all day long, folks. How do we live Monday through Saturday? Verse 11, he says, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. I like that because I know a little bit about being a father. Oh, verse 12 kind of throws me off a little bit. Encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God and spanking you behind when you're out of line. That's the Lake County version. When I think of a father, I think of my dad. My dad was a good father. And I like to be a, I, like, I strive to be a better dad than my dad, which is almost impossible, I think. But I took being a father serious. The verse 12 says, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. As an earthly father, I was comforting, I was encouraging, but I was also disciplinarian and all of those things. So I had, as an earthly father, I have this understanding of what my responsibility, my role is as a father to my children. And so when I read this verse, I see, okay, for you, no, uh, he says, we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. You know, I can talk, my two daughters are different. They're pretty much very similar today in a lot of ways. They were stark contrast when they were younger. And the way I talked to Natalie, I could never talk to Christy. They were opposite. So a father knows his children. You can't just a square peg through the round hole doesn't work. You can't treat them all the same. You can't treat them all the same because that's not fair. People say, it is fair. No, it's not. It's not fair to treat everybody the same. Treat people the way they need to be treated, and you have to tweak that, and you have to be smart enough to figure that out. You have to care enough to figure it out. You can't. Well, you know what? I can talk to Brother Frank, and I can reveal some cold, hard truth to him because we have a relationship that's been for years you know, on a different level. I can pretty much tell him whatever I want, and he may be offended, but he's going to get over it. I can't apply that same principle to I could probably rob, but not to uh, John or, or Sonny because we're not there, and I can't do that. Now, it may be similar, but they're different. You can't treat everybody the same, and you have to care enough about that person. You've got to know enough about them. You can't just use this whole blanket. In the Army, we call it carpet bombing. You send, you send a bomber over, like when, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, somebody said, why don't you send a bomber over and just carpet bomb Kuwait? And I'm like, hello? You can't just carpet bomb Kuwait? There's men, women, and children who ain't even fighting. There's elderly people, there's hospitals there. There's a whole lot of people that are going to get bombed when you drop those bombs. Say, You're going to nuke them all. Well, you can't nuke them all. There's people there who are non-combatants. You can't just go in and just kill everybody. Why not? Let God sort them out. That's the barbaric mentality that some, anyway, I'm some laughing, but I'm telling you, that's true. We take the same approach with church. Just throw it out there. It doesn't work that way. He says, you know how we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting. Some need the encouraging, some need the comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. You know, the Bible says to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. The Bible says to live as, if, as one who will be judged under the law. We have a responsibility to urge and to encourage one, one another to live in holiness, not to beat each other down. He used two examples, one as a mother and one as a father. This is how we lived. Uh, we modeled this for you, he said. And I go back to uh, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law when I was a kid. I met him, I wasn't 15, I was probably 13 or so. And I was 13. Lord have mercy. That was like 30 years ago, and I was a, I was a poor soul. But anyway, the old adage, it takes a village to raise a child, is absolutely true. My brother-in-law, from a worldly perspective, not from a spiritual lens, but from a worldly perspective, showed me how to be, how to be a man, how to man up. How to get out of my scrawny little body and put, put on a little bit of a physique. Learned me how to, taught me how to play uh, basketball. It was really something I wasn't interested in playing. Taught me how to be a competitor. And he brought out that, the character that was in me. He helped develop me as a young man. It's important. 
He was, a, he was a role model to me. And in our churches, our spiritual leaders, our pastors, our deacons, our Sunday school teachers, if you're leading a men's Bible study or a women's Bible study, you're a role model to people. And you have a responsibility to carry yourself as such. The implication is huge. I think it was uh, Brother Nick Wooden last week shared with me about radio towers. He says, he says, we use the ripple effect, he says, but it gets convoluted as we begin to, you know, you throw the pebble in the water and how that interferes or affects everyone else. But he says radio frequencies. Now stay with me because most of you probably get this because we live in a technological age. But Frank Encinas lives his life and he pings and he sends out these radio waves. Stay with me. You probably could easily follow this because of the time we live in. But his radio wave hits Jose Burgos and Brother Hank and Tina. And then what happens is, we subsequently ping. I ping and set out radio waves. Tina pings. Hank pings. And we send it out. And we affect the next people who receive those waves. Your life is intertwined with many, many other people beyond your wildest belief. You will not imagine how your life has impacted somebody else. I have to change the story. I have to share the story. I came out the Army. Before I went up to the Army, I, was, I worked for McDonald's in East Chicago. Not that that's important, but anyway. Uh, then I left for the Army. I was 17 when I worked at McDonald's. Left for the Army at 17. Come back four years later, 21 now. Married, kid, we go to Shakey's. I got one year. Shakey's, I get an amen? Okay, <laughs> yeah, all right. Shakey's? Amen. Yes. Shakey's. Yes. Yes. Shakey's. Yes. So we, we go to Shakey's to eat. And we're eating. And the bulls were killing somebody on TV. I can't remember who it was. We were watching on the screen. And we're eating. It's, game's over, so we're done eating. See how that how it just happens to dovetail. It's pretty interesting. But anyway, uh, we get up to leave. And Rob and Emily are walking in front of me. And Tina. Tina's in front of me. And this dude runs into me. And he goes, hey. And he shakes my hand. He goes, how you doing, man? And I'm looking at him like, all right. He won't let go of my hand. Right. That's what I'm thinking. And he's like, how you doing, man? You remember me? And I was like, no. He says, yeah, we worked at McDonald's together. Blah, blah, blah. He keeps talking. You remember that, Rob? And Rob and, and Emmy keep walking. And Tina walks to catch up. And she looks back. She's like, and he's got to let go of my hand. He won't let go of my hand. And then he goes, remember? And he gives me his name. I'm like, no. He said, man, we just fried burgers together. And I'm like, he's still like this. And I'm like, no. And he's like, Come on, he's going, he's trying to jog my memory, and I felt terrible. At this point in time, I said, oh, yeah, 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 man, what's up, dude? How you doing? Rob tells Tina he has no idea who that is. <laughs> Rob was right. He was right. I didn't have a clue. I didn't have the foggiest idea who this dude was. He told me who he was. He described days we worked together. I remember those days. I remember doing what he said. I don't remember him. Yeah, man. He was saying, he laughed, he slapped, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I remember all that except you. <laughs> but he remembered me. And so I'm like, hey, man, nice seeing you, man. I got to catch up, man. You take care of yourself. You know, give him a manly hug. <clears throat> bromance. That's what we call it. Bromance. <clears throat> One of these. Take care of yourself, man. I walk over there, and Tina goes, who was that? And I go, I don't have a clue. And Rob goes, I told you. And they start laughing. <laughs> so you're like, well, what's the point in that story? It's a good story, and I tell you. My life, and this is what Rob told me as we went out to the parking lot. We're getting ready to get in the car. He said, Jose, he says, your life impacts people on a level you'll have no idea. You'll never know how your life has impacted somebody else. In this case, you just happen to get a glimpse of that. He says, but you meant something to this kid. Apparently, he didn't mean a hill of beans to you because you don't remember him. He said, but there'll be people in your life. I'm, I'm word for word almost what Rob told me. 20 years ago, 20-something years ago, he says, there'll be people in your life that you will remember like he remembered you. He says, you're impacting people. People are impacting you. He says, but you're making an impact in people's life, positive or negative, but you're impacting people. Christian, I'm telling you the same thing. That was from a worldly perspective. Just trust me, there was nothing spiritual about that conversation as we should rec recall the stories from Mickey D's. I won't repeat them, but anyway. Um... On a spiritual level, your life is impacting people. 
So we're going back to verse 11. You know that we dealt with each one of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who's called you into his kingdom and glory. He says, and we also thank God continually because you received the word of God, which you heard from us. You accepted it, not as words of men, but as what it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. And I thought this was pretty cool as I um, studied for this and I unpacked this. The word of God. We consider that to be the Bible, right? The Bible is the word of God. The word of God is the, the gospel we're presenting to people. But he says, we thank God continually because you receive the word of God. The Bible says that Jesus was the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So when a person receives the word of God, what they're really receiving is Jesus Christ. And if you're doing it like this, let me tell you about this Savior, man. Let me tell you about this Jesus who loves you and died. That's one thing, and he's receiving that. And when you're doing it another way, when you're demonstrating and living it out and people are receiving your testimony, they're receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. It's more than just the words. It's the Lord, in fact, it's the Lord himself, what they are receiving. There's eternal implications. He says, you heard it from us, accepted it as not words of men, but actually as what it is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Interesting enough, which is at work in you who believe. The Bible says that when you become a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. Amen? We know that the Holy Spirit is God Almighty. Amen? We know that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Amen? We know that God the Father is God Almighty. Amen? But we also know that the Holy Spirit is not Jesus. Amen? And we know that Jesus is not the Father. Amen? Okay. So we have this very difficult concept of a triune God. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Because God is just too deep and too marvelous for us to say, I, I got him. You don't got him. You got a little piece of him. You got a little crumb. That's right. What he reveals to us and what he gives us the ability to comprehend. But the Trinity, how does that work? I had a person tell me, raised in Catholicism, I don't pray to Jesus. Jesus is not God. I said, really? Nope. Why not? Well, because, you know, it's about taking the Lord's name in vain. Person, you know, well, JC, that's not, you know, somebody screams out Jesus Christ. That's not a profanity. That's not using the Lord's name in vain. So how so? Well, because Jesus is not God. I said, I disagree. And we have this conversation. Of course, it never ends because the person's got a hard, strong opinion. But biblically, I can support that. What do you got to support your theory? And so here's the thing. Jesus is not God. How do you figure that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says, let us create man in our image and our likeness. The Bible says that all the fullness of the deity dwelt in Christ. This is not, the Bible says Jesus, he's, he's the son of God. Well, yes, he is indeed the son of God. So he's not God. Wrong. He's indeed God Almighty. It's a very difficult concept to understand, but this I know. The Bible says that Jesus Christ will judge the world. So you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So you could say you don't answer to him if you want to, but you do, because he is God. Amen? Amen. This I know. And so the person, well, we're just going to have to end this conversation because we have to agree to disagree. I said, absolutely. But if you ever want the truth, just let me know. <laughs> because I got it. It's right here. Right. I'm not talking something crazy. I support what I believe from here. So he says, which you heard from us, you've accepted it as the word, but as it actually is, it's the word of God, which is at work in you. So if it's at work in you, he's talking about the word at work in you. The Holy Spirit of God is in you, and it works in you and through you to bring about God's results, God's desired purpose for your life. Now, we don't have to do it, but if you want to do it, that's the source. See, the Bible, God is a gentleman. God is not going to buffalo his way into your heart. He gently knocks. He's a whisper, and he calls out to you. And you have the right to receive him, and you can reject him. Your, your call. But when, he, when, you, when you do receive God, it is only through his power, the power that's available to you through his spirit, that you can even accomplish what he's called you to do. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. Amen? He, that's a fact. So 
He says it is at work in you. Verse 14, for you, brothers, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. This, they displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they must be saved. In this way, you're always heaped up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Listen, this imitators of God's church, he says, you suffered at the hand of your own countrymen. He's, he's telling them that uh, they displease God. He's shown all this hostility towards the gospel, yet it did not hinder the proliferation of the gospel it did not hinder, it did not stop the spread. God's wrath has come upon them at last. Verse 4, 17, he says, you become imitators, imitators, imitators. I go back to the Titanic. Remember that? I told you Leonardo DiCaprio was walking around like this. He, he saw that modeled by other people. So he knew how to pretend to be a gentleman. He had no clue. He had no schooling. So he's, he's imitating what he sees. Frank, I think, shared, uh, well, they took little Nolan, you guys know his grandson, Frank and Teresa, we were out to eat somewhere on Ponderosa or something, and Nolan gets up, he walks into a room full of people, you don't know, you don't know. He's little, it's, it's a year ago at least, he's probably two. He walks in and he's like. <laughs> the whole place. <laughs> what do you think he's doing? He's imitating what he sees here. It won't be long before he picks up F-bombs and everything else if that's what you're using in his presence. We imitate what we see. Church, we have a responsibility. The, the Bible says to be holy, for I am holy. We have a responsibility. And people say, oh, I'm not perfect. I understand that. But are you even striving to please God with your life? We have people who have set out before us. We have the word of God that is our model, that it is our barometer, it is our litmus uh, test. Verse 17, he says, but brothers... When we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly. I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. <laughs> All right. Satan stopped us. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. It is not you. Indeed, you are the glory. You are our glory and joy. The love and the affection that Paul has for this church. I want to draw your attention back to this. The, the problem, I heard it once said that the, mat, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. Folks, we want what we want. We don't want what we don't want. We don't want to be inconvenienced. Oh, pastor, I don't want to go visit so-and-so. I don't want to stop him. I don't want to do that. Somebody came here today and saw that there was snow on the sidewalk and grabbed the shovel and shoveled it without being asked to do so. This person said, hey, somebody's got to get this snow up. Might as well be me. Okay, we, did this person really want to do that? Maybe, but the average person probably don't. I ain't pushing the shovel. I came out one time um, after midnight's. A lot of snow out front. I went out there with a shovel and I shoveled it myself. Why? Because I was the first one here. That's why. You're the pastor. You ought not do that. Well, who's going to do it? I'll do it. I'm not above that. And so we don't want to be inconvenienced. The heart, of the, matter, the, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. We want what we want. We don't want what we don't want. People are like, I want security. We don't want no terrorists on the airplanes blowing up towers and stuff. We don't want no more of that. We need security. Government has a responsibility to protect us. Then you go to the airport. They're like, sir, I need you to take off your shoes, turn your socks inside out, go ahead and strip down your underwear and step into this thing. And, go, and you're like, what? Security. Hey, no, start with him, the dude with the beard. Don't, don't mess with me. I'm an American. But well, it don't work that way. We want security. But we don't want, we don't want to be inconvenienced by it. We want the police. As long as they ain't pulling me over for speeding. You know, we need this. We want, but nobody wants to be inconvenienced. Paul is sharing his heart and how he loves these, 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 this church and how he desires to come be there with them and how he wants to pour into them. And he gives Satan some credit here. Go back one, Amy. Go back one more. Yeah, there it is. For we wanted to come to you, we wanted to come to you, most of us really don't want to, 
Let's be honest. There's a game on today. I don't want to come by and visit. Somebody's got snow to shovel. I'm tired. I'm hungry. You got other things to do, places to go, people to see. I don't got time. Too hot, boss. That's another one. Too hot. Too cold. It's always something. I don't have a shovel. Well, I got two. Oh, oh. then you think of another excuse. But uh, we wanted to come to you. Certainly we did. He says, I, Paul, I did again and again. I wanted to come. But, the, but Satan, he said, stopped us. I couldn't get there because of Satan. Listen, folks. Though Satan is real, the Bible says he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking to tear you up. We give him way too much credit. The Bible says that we're led away by our own evil desires. We're tempted by what's in our heart, which is why Satan came to Jesus and said, if you're the son of God, turn those, breads to stone, turn those stones to bread. What was inside Jesus at that time was hunger pains. <laughs> so he came to Christ and said, hey, hey, those make some nice loaves of bread. And Jesus said, Lake County version, of course, oh, I'm sure they would. And 41 days from now, I will definitely get some. You know, that's not what he said. But Jesus said, I'm not, you're not going to tempt me. Jesus said, I'm hungry, yes. But Satan was using what's inside of Christ at the time. So we're led away, we're led astray by our own evil and selfish desires that are already within us in our own sinful nature. So we give Satan credit. The devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do nothing. He could tempt you and tease you and try to chump you out all he wants to, but he can't make you do nothing. God does not infringe on your free will. You think he's going to let dev the devil do it? He's not. So... He said, Satan stopped us. I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm not sure what it was, but Paul was sure. People say, well, here's your three enemies. You ready? Satan is one of them. He's probably the least powerful of them all, believe it or not. Unless you give him the power, then he's going to wreak havoc in your life. But the other enemy is the world in which we live in, peer pressure. Eventually, we come caving in. Okay. Can't beat them, join them. Too hard to be a Christian, so I'm just going to be quiet and live a defeated life. The world in which we live in is your other enemy. And your third one, you know who he is? Look him in the mirror. It's you, folks. We are our biggest enemy. We are the most powerful enemy because we have a sinful nature that wars against the things of God and the things that we desire that are not godly things. That is powerful. But there's victory in the spirit. We can live in the spirit. The Bible says you live in the spirit, you're not satisfied those desires of the flesh. Outside of the spirit, you are subject to the flesh, the carnal, the unspiritual things of the world. But then the next thing is the world in which we live in is very, very powerful because of the peer pressure, cultural uh, society norms. It's going to come a time where preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ is going to probably be a crime. We're probably not far from that, where the pastors in Texas, I think it was, were subpoenaed. They wanted to subpoena their, their sermon notes. I'm like, really? Because the mayor, I think, of that city was a lesbian. And they said, hate crimes. You're preaching against, you know, uh, sexual morality, and you're calling out lesbians and gays. And they demanded all the pastors in that city, turn in your sermon notes, subpoenaed. Fortunately, that went away. They rescinded that subpoena, but that's not the point. The point is there's going to come a time where they're not going to rescind that subpoena. Good news is I got no notes. They can have them. <laughs> they'll subpoena the live stream. They'll take the live stream. They'll watch that. It'll be entered into evidence. Okay? So Satan is indeed powerful, but he's the least powerful of your three enemies. You are your greatest enemy. The second one is the world in which we live in. And Satan is the third and the least influential, believe it or not, even though he's wreaking havoc in all those realms. But he, he's, he doesn't have any power over you unless you relinquish it. Okay? Now, there are times, I'm going to go back to Acts chapter 6 to prove this to you, and 16, to prove this to you, there's times where it's neither of those three. It's just God's will. For example, it's one of my favorite passages. I know I say that all the time. Acts chapter 16, verse 6, the scripture read, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. The Holy Spirit said no. They wanted to preach in Asia, and the Holy Spirit said nope. Now, what did that look like? Not sure. But they clearly gave the credit to the Holy Spirit of God and not to Satan. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. Once again, the Holy Spirit of God preventing them from doing things. 
Why? I don't know why. doesn't say. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him to come to Macedonia. After Paul had seen the vision, he got up at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to the Macedonians. There's going to be all kinds of obstacles in your life, whether they keep you from doing things or you think, you know, it's what I want to do. God sometimes says yes, and like a good father, sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it is your own doing and the consequences of our sins that keeps us from doing things. Sometimes Satan is working overtime. There's spiritual warfare going on. Daniel 10.10 speaks of the angel that was responding to a prayer request and was held up for 21 days before he could get there. So there's all kinds of things. Don't give Satan too much credit because your biggest enemy is yourself. Okay, we need to... The problem here is he's talking about coming to see them. He says, and he couldn't get to see them because of Satan. Okay, and he knows that's true. Our problem isn't Satan. Our problem is we don't want to go see him. Well, your brother's hurt. Nah, somebody else will go see him. Well, your brother needs your help. Ah, somebody else can help him. Why don't you come to church and, uh, you know, support so-and-so's, uh, you know, Sunday school class. Or, ah, he'll have people there. We don't want to. And you know what, folks? I can stand here and I can preach all day, every day. I can't change your want-tos. That's on you. And it comes down to a, um, a matter of love, really. I think it was Tammy Keppel shared on a Tuesday night. We kept saying, uh, I, kept, I think we kept saying a, a burden or a responsibility was the word. I can't remember what it was. And she says, that's not how I see it. She says, I don't see serving God as a burden or, or, or a responsibility. She says, when you love somebody, you just do for them. It just pours out nice and easy. Oh, sacrifice. That's the word we used. She said, it's not a sacrifice. She says, I love to serve the Lord. And I can't understand why somebody would feel like it's a sacrifice. And, and my response to that was, my children. When my children were born, there were things that just we were just weren't going to do. We were not going away on a couple's retreat for a week and leaving my kids with anybody. We were not going to movies. There's places we were not going and leaving my kids. We took them everywhere. We did everything together. So the couple time comes later in life for us. Now it's about being a family. And that was a sacrifice that I was willing to make, that I wanted to make. And I gladly made it. But it was indeed a sacrifice where I was putting somebody else before myself, in this case, my children. And so honoring somebody is the same thing. When you give somebody honor, that means you put them before yourself. Do we honor God with our life? Do we sacrifice? Do we live a life sacrificing our life for God, giving back to him just a little piece of what he's given to us? It's such a tiny offering compared to Calvary, but nevertheless, I lay it at your feet. That's what we're singing. It's a tiny offering. I cannot ever repay Jesus for what he's done for me, ever. So I bring this tiny offering. It's such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. But nevertheless, you lay it at the feet. The Bible says present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to your God. It is the reasonable act of service. That's what's reasonable. Presenting your life before God and say, God, here it is. Do what you will. You know, I pray, one of my prayers is that my children, my daughters, will serve the Lord the rest of their life. That they don't walk away from that that their children, my grandson, that he'll serve the Lord. You know, my grandson will sit down and eat, and he'll fold his hands, and he'll pray for it. He'll lead the prayer. My grandson, two and a half. He used to do the one-eyed prayer. <laughs> now he closes them both. They're kinda, he's he's kind of like Oriental. You're like, oh. I, I think he's still peeking, but he's praying. He's praying, and he's learning that we're imitating that. He's, we're, we're investing in him. And that's my prayer, that my children, my grandchildren will, will live the rest of their life serving God. And uh, they're not going to get that if we don't give it to them. And so really, that core value relationships is hard. We've been here four years. We've been in this building. We've been together four years. And I bet you, I'm not going to single anybody out, but I bet you there's somebody in here who knows that they should have could have or would have built a relationship with so-and-so. They just didn't. I bet you. Been meaning to have them over for dinner. Just never got around to it. Four years later? 
We're pathetic, folks. Building relationships is hard. I can't make, this ain't kindergarten. I can't say, hey, you're going to be my best friend. <laughs> best friend, he's my best friend. That don't work that way. <laughs> Friendships develop. And we're not, I mean, and some of us are putting forth really good effort. We are, and we're getting there. But we got a long way to go, folks. And this church in Thessalonica got it right. <laughs> They're a great model of what that looks like. Baby church in its infancy, maturing in faith like nobody's business. Why? Because they wanted to. That's the bottom line. I can't make you want to. I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we close. And just ask the Lord, what is it? where is that hardness of your heart? Is it in any relationships or any area of your life, in your spiritual life, where you need to grow? Ask God to stretch you. I want you to examine yourself now as we pray and just ask the Lord to reveal to you those areas that are challenging for you. It's worth it. And there's eternal implications. Join me in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord. Father, I thank you for this day you've given us, Lord, for this time you've allowed us to gather together, Lord. Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord, to lift you up, Lord. Father, you are awesome, Lord. You've given us your very best, Lord. You've given us all that you are. You've paid the price, Lord, for the sacrifice for our sins, Lord. You sent us your spirit, Lord, to indwell us, to guide and direct us, Lord, to convict the world of sin. Father, you've done all of that. And all we have to do is receive that with genuine gratitude and living a life that, love, that, that honors you and loving you and sacrifice, Lord, becomes easier when we recognize what you've done for us. So Father, I pray that your spirit would move about this place even now, that you would touch the hearts of those that are here. Father, that we would make a commitment, Lord, to love you, to serve you. As your word teaches, Father, it is our reasonable act of service in light of what you've done for us. Father, we praise you. Thank you, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would give us the desire. Give us the desires, Lord. Your word teaches that if we delight ourselves in you, that you will give us the desires of our heart. So, Father, I pray that we would do that, that we would delight ourselves in you, and that the desires of our heart would be the desires of yours, and that is to love you more and to love people like ourselves. Father, we'll be careful to give you all praise and all glory and all honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.